Welcome to Live Daf, your online Daf Yomi Shir. Shalom Aleichem, welcome back to today's Daf Hayomi Maseches Erech and Daf Zayin. We begin 17 lines from the top of the Yomad at the Tana Rabbana. So we learned in a price how you ate say Lehurig, a fellow is being taken out by the the, bezin, the uh, Jewish Bezin for execution for uh, an Avera that he committed. Okay, so this condemned fellow happens to have a carbon pending. A carbon that he brought to the Bishab Midash on account of a different experience. The Kehanim will spray the blood on the Mizbeach. Mazen Olaf, they sprayed on account of him for him, meaning they processed the carbon, Midam Chatasoy, the blood of his Chatas, Midam Hashamoy, and the blood of his, uh, and or the blood of his Asham. However, Chatabay says, Shah, suppose he sinned at that moment on death row, in this Kokonli, we don't apply ourselves to his situation, meaning we don't obligate him to. Uh, we don't have him, you know, designate a carbon for our crop. Why? My timer, why is that? I'm a because if so, you're going to delay the proceedings. You're going to delay the implementation of his execu- execution, which is unacceptable. It's called Inu Yihadin, delaying judgment, putting him in, in, in torment, in emotional turmoil. So we don't do that. I'm a Rabbi We don't prolong. Delay judgment, which is Inu Yihadin. I'm only a bai. Yeah, if that's the case, I feel the nami. So that explains why we're not going to initiate a new carbon process. But what about the first case? He already has that, you know, carbon designated. We take it, we process it. It's going to take time. The answer is, we're speaking after shechita. It's just a matter of a couple of seconds to do the blood. That we do. Kigoyin shahiyah zivchay. We're speaking that his carbon was already zavuach, was already shechted by Sasha at that moment. Says the Gemara. So suppose it's still before shechita, we don't proceed. Aval, but if ain zivcha zavuach by Sasha, my the carbon had not yet been shechted. My, what happens, Lloyd? You would not proceed. If that's the case, so so why would the Bryce have to resort in, in trying to present a, a contrasting case? To resort to a fellow who had not yet even designated a carbon to highlight the fact that we back off and we don't delay matters to accommodate this carbon. Why such a lengthy case? Meaning, the bicycle could have simply said, look, even if he has a carbon waiting, but it's still before Shechita, we do not proceed. What's the Allah? And the Tony Seifa. So let's move on to the next part of the um, Brisa the Tani. So instead of saying Chata Brisa Shav, he sinned at that moment. In his Kachanli, we don't get involved and you know have him. We don't have him set aside the carbon because it's going to delay the process. Even if he has a carbon, lift like we listen to the other Brisa could have simply drawn a line, made a distinction within that case that everybody has a carbon waiting. That depends on what stage. When do we proceed? When the Shechit already occurred, just a matter of doing the Zerika. But let's say the Shechit had not yet occurred. Lord, we do not proceed. If that's in case true. That's exactly what the Bible means to say. When do we proceed? It's already shechted. It's just a matter of doing the zrika, a quick process. But if it's not yet shechted, the nasa kimisha chata by The Bible is just highlighting that delaying, waiting for shechita is as though it's still before shechita. Nasa kimi. It's as though he sinned and he's starting a new process. We're not going to delay. We're not going to wait around. Vain is cooking loy. And we do not uh, have him set aside the carbon because it's going to delay matters. Says the mission. Ha'isha, she also a woman, is on her way out to be executed by the bezin. 
And she happens to be expectant. Ain Mamtin in I should tell you, we don't wait until the birth occurs. And we're going to see in the Gemara, we learned from a Pasuk that at this point it's, it's one indivisible entity. So the condemned uh, status applies to both equally. It's one entity. However, once she starts giving birth, Ho'isha Shiyashva, she's already sitting on the mashbar, on this you know, seat, a la mashbar, where she's giving birth, Mamtin la At that point, you have to wait until the birth occurs, and then we proceed to apply the uh, verdict on the on the mother. Ho'isha Shenerga, Nenim Bissara, if the, the Bezin carried out death penalty on the woman, her hair is permissible, there's no Isra Hano, the will explain exactly how this works. Behema Shenerga, as opposed to an animal which was killed by the Bezdin for you know attacking a person in this case Asura Bano everything in the animals Asur is off limits we learn this from a Pasuk Rashi brings it Gemara Psachim Balashar Naki he's clean meaning we talk totally it's totally Asur for him to partake in any part of this animal so in the first example we had the Isha being taken out of the we don't wait for the uh, birth to happen Pshit says the Gemara and uh, you know we, 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 we apply it to both as one Shita, of course, Kufahi. I mean, at that point, the fetus is part of, parcel of the mother's entity. It's part of a guf. So why would I uh, differentiate? Why would I? Says the more Isrich. So even though it's Kufahi, Isrich, there's room to think that perhaps we do wait. Perhaps we don't apply the verdict to both. Salgadet, I mean, there's room to think, hey, look, Siv, since the Pasuk, in describing uh, an episode where a fellow struck a woman, and harm the offspring, Pasuk says, the father sends him a bill. Kasher Yosha is all about Isha, he has to pay up for the damages to the offspring. So, apparently, the. So, what, what is the Pasuk teaching us? That the father has a, a monetary you know, interest in these offspring, it's, it's like his. Mamani the Balu, so perhaps in this case as well, we treat it like the father's possession, but we shouldn't deprive him of this possession. He has an element of ownership there. Kamash, the point is, no, says the why? Maybe you're right. Why should we apply this judgment to the offspring if the mother sinned? Amar Rabbi Avo, Amar Rabbi Yechon, Amar the Pasuk says, Umei Sogam Shneim, both are put to death. That Pasuk is adding the offspring as well. Rabbi Savlat, to include the unborn as well. Well, have I mean, by the way, well, this Pasuk, Umei Sogam Shneim, is needed for a different Allah, unavailable for this. Achi Yu Shneim Shavim. Rashi explains, speaking about man and woman who interacted improperly, they both get Misa, provided that um, they're, they're adult, they uh, reach adulthood. They're both equal, meaning they both reach adulthood. Otherwise, if one is below age, underage, there's no, uh, you know, Besan does not apply Misa to that person. In any case, the Pasuk is used for something else already, the Rabbi Ishiya. So how do we have a source for our halacha today? Kikam rinu gam. We're coming from the word gam. Gam shneim is coming to add the unborn as well. Yashalamashb. Once she's begun the birthing process, then we wait. My time awa. Even the akar, since the offspring has already left his station, guvach rinu. Now we consider him as a separate body, independent of the mother. We have to wait for the birth. And then we apply it to the mother. Amar vidu amar shmol. Isha she hayet laharik. The woman was being taken out. Makin oisa we whack her connected base heroin near the womb to kadei she almost have lot to terminate the life of the offspring tchila beforehand. Why? To preserve the honor of, of the mother, so that after she's put to death, there shouldn't be a, like a birthing experience which is bizayin hamais. So in order to preserve her dignity. We do this so that the Vlad dies within and then there's no birthing process. Kadesha Lay Tava De Nivo so shouldn't come to shame. Says the Gemara Lemaimra the Kadma Mesa, so the concern is perhaps she'll die first, and then the birthing will happen. Is that the way it happens? Is that the uh, the order of things that she dies first and then the offspring? In which case it carries this type of concern that he might leave the mother after her death. Lemaimra the Kadma Umesa Baresh, is that true? Well Kaimal, we have a, a rule. The Vlad met my Baresha to Child, the unborn actually dies first within the mother, and then the mother dies. This now we have a Mishnah, Tinik ben Yaimai. So a one-day-old baby, meaning as soon as he's born, he has the ability to be noichel to inherit, to bring in inheritance himself 
from you know his mother's family, and then he can transfer it over to his father's family. So even if he dies, that Yerusha, that inheritance has sort of gone through him. He he serves as a transfer point, as a conduit. He gets his mother's possessions, and then when he dies, who inherits him? His father's family, Umanchal. The Mishnah means Noichal Benichseim, if he's one day old, then his mother dies. He receives his mother's Yerusha. And when he dies, Lahanchal, he transfers it over Lacham and Av to his brothers from his father's side. But in any case, what do we see from this Mishnah? He has to be born. Dafka ben he has to be at least one day, meaning he has to be born. But suppose he was never born. His mother died carrying him inside. It wouldn't work. He wouldn't be able to be Yerush and then pass it on. Why? Because he never existed after his mother's passing. He dies first. To my inspiration. If his mother died, then inevitably he died first. And once he dies, he can't. He doesn't have the ability to accept Yerusha. A son will not inherit from his mother. Bekever, once he's in the grave, meaning once he's lifeless. In order to serve as a conduit to pass it on to his father's family. In any case, what do we see from the halacha, this Mishnah? That the presumed order of events is that offspring dies first and then mother. That's true when we speak in terms of a natural death. I did a lot since the offspring, his life force is, is minimal relative to the mother. So when the mother's life starts diminishing, who is affected first? The offspring within her. Ayla Tipa, the Gemara illustrates it in an illustrative way that the, uh, the droplet of the Malachamavas of the Malachamavas comes and when he comes to visit, he affects the child first. The Machatach of Siman, he breaks through, he cuts, terminates the Siman and, uh, you know, the windpipe, esophagus, expression, meaning the uh, source of life of the, uh, of the offspring. And then, it affects the mother as well. So he's the one that's affected first. But in our Mishnah, when she's put to death manually, not, not due to natural causes, he may separation. In this case, we assume mother will die first. And that carries a concern of shame that might happen after she's passed on and the offspring comes out. So we uh, apply this process to avoid it. Ask the Gemara, but otherwise, if the natural death, you say the uh, offspring dies first. There was a story of Parchas, and he moved around. The offspring was in the mother. Atlas Perchusi. Up until three movements, Atlas Perchusi Parsi. Time it takes to walk through, to go travel through Parsi, meaning they discern the signs of life within the mother. Even after the mother died, says, well, it's not necessarily a sign of life, it's just a nervous twitch, it's just, you know, residual effects of the, of the terminated life. Mida the Havi, you know, like an example would be Aznav, the tail of the Tov, a lizard, and Pachesis, that throw, has death throws despite the fact that it had been detached from the actual lizard. So, it's not really a sign of life. Omar of Nachman Mashmur. Ho'isha Shiyoshu ala Mashmur. So despite the fact that we assume that when natural death occurs, the mother, the, the uh, offspring dies first, nevertheless, it's not absolute, it's not conclusive. There, there's a chance otherwise. Therefore, a woman who's sitting and giving birth, and she passes away, it's on Shabbos, we be in Sakin, we quickly grab a knife, we open her belly, we take out the fetus, just in case he's still alive. Pshita said, the What's the big deal? My oven, what are you doing? At worst case, you're cutting lifeless meat, which is not us. My oven, mechatech. Basar, mechatech, 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 just cutting meat. And Rashi brings that the chi of the Isra is only for a malacha. Malacha is an alive person extracting blood. It's, it's, that, that's the malacha. Blood is life, right? But here is no life. Mechatech, basar, a marabal in Israel must be that the allowance is not just a matter of cutting, but even to bring it through the street. Lahabi Sakan to deliver the knife. Derech through Shusarab, which is typically a malach. In this case, you're allowed to in order to extricate the offspring just in case it's alive. My Kamash, what's the point of the halacha? The that on account, on, account, on account of an uncertainty 
even a chance of saving a life. Shabbat will desecrate Shabbos. Tanina, that's old news. We learned it back in Masechah Yuma. Even for a small chance, it justifies Chilul Shabbos. For instance, Mishnah Nafal of a a person who was sitting and he, suddenly uh, a building collapses over him. And we're not sure about his status. We're not even sure if he's there. We think he was there. Suffolk Husham, there's a Suffolk whether he's there. Suffolk maybe Anisham, maybe he's not. Suffolk Chai, maybe he's alive. Suffolk maybe he's not alive. Suffolk Khan, maybe he's a guy. Suffolk Saul Yisrael. Since there's a slight chance that he might be saving a Jewish life, and Fakh and all of Sagal, we go and we extricate, we uh, dig out the, uh, the rubble. So we know that even for a Suffolk, says the Gemara Mal the perhaps there's room to differentiate because Hossam. In contrast to the case of the collapsed building, you know there was a, there was a person who had a chazaka de chayusa, was established as a live person. So now we just go with that. And we have to address that possibility. But in our case of the fetus, we don't even know if he was alive. He was never an established person. Right? So halachically, he doesn't have a chazaka of chayim. Avalocha de leyav le chazaka de chiusim yikara. Because until then he was just fetus. We never really established that it was even a viable child, right? Amos, so perhaps he shouldn't go to this extent. To go and, and uh, see if you can save him. Mashman, the point is yes. Even for a slight chance, we have Mechal Shabbos. That's a precious a life of a Yiddis to Hashem. The mission says if the, uh, the woman was uh, put to death by the Bezin, her hair is permissible. There's no Isser to benefit from the hair, as opposed to a Behema. Behema Shenerga. Behema put to death by the Bezin due to. Uh, the fact that it attacked a person, in that case, everything, including the here, Asura Bahano, everything is off limits. Says the Gemara. Why, by the Isha, is the Seir, uh, the Heir Mutter, Ramai Isuri Hano Ninu? We know that a lifeless person, one may not benefit, one may not have enough from a lifeless person. Rashi brings that a mace. Is Asr Bahano, actually on the fourth line, because it says that Thomas Sham Miriam, and we have that zero Shava, that link. Sham over here, and Sham stated by the Egla Rufa, where it's Asr Bahano, so we learn that you cannot benefit from a mace. So why is her here? Mutter, Bahamai, says the Gemara, is Surihana Ninu. Amarav was speaking by Emeris that the, the woman declares before her death that she's giving away, she's granting her hair. To, uh, to her daughter. So, by doing so, she's now sort of separating it conceptually from herself. Hence, it's unaffected by her death. Amar Abba Meris, she gives away, she pledges, Tnu. She says, give away my hair, Sa'ari Labiti. Ask the Gemara. Well, if it's part of her, how can you just, she just sort of separate it? Halakhically, it's part of her. For instance, Ilu, uh, imagine she would say, Amra, Tru Yadi, Lebiti, give away my hand to my daughter. Of course, it wouldn't have any value. Mi Avin in law, would we give the uh, hand to the, uh, to the daughter? Of course not. It's part of the mace, it's also Bahano. So why is the hair different? Amarav. We're not speaking about hair that's attached. We're talking about a wig. The Pea, it's a wig, Nachris. Fire and wig, meaning it's comprised of hair of, uh, you know, of a different woman. So basically, it's not hair growing on her. Rashi says it was a derech, it was common for women who have less hair to find you know, other hair, other women, and form into a wig and wear it. So in any case, we're not speaking about her own. Meaning we're not talking about hair that's attached to her. We're talking about a wig made of hair her own or her friends, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but it's detached. In which case, if 
A, it's detached. B, she pledges it to her daughter, so it's unaffected by her death. But apparently we need both conditions present. Detached and pledged, time up. So it's only because the Amr she said, Snu, give it away. Holy Amr Tnu, but otherwise she'd not give it away. Without that declaration, Gufa Hiu Mitzah would be considered like part of herself and become Asr due to her death. So it's only because she gave it away, Rashi says. In that case, it's Kenetula Mechaim Damya. It's as if it's been removed during her lifetime because she pledges it away. But without that added element, you wouldn't say so. It would be considered like part of her. The truth is, we have a Shaila elsewhere in the Gemara. He had a question. And he didn't really resolve his question. So this question um, pertained to a different topic. Irhani Dachas, a city whose residents had worshipped idols. Allah is that all those who committed that sin are put to death and their possessions are burnt and even those who did not join. So their spirit, but their possessions, even their clothing, it all, get, all gets burnt. It joins the fray. And the question is like this. The boy of Yisra Rechanina. Sar, Noshem Sitkani. So what about the uh, Noshem Sitkani, the righteous woman, meaning the women who had not taken part in the Avoy uh, Sar? What happens to their hair? Mao. Is it considered like their possessions? And it's slated for destruction? Or is it like their own body, which is not? Which is spirit? But my Rabbi, we're not speaking about, you know, hair growing on a person. Of course, that's part of the person. But my Rabbi Be'a Nachris, come and this question pertains to this wig. And the question was whether it's considered like part of their goof and doesn't need to be destroyed, or is it like their money, like their possessions, and must be destroyed along with everything else. Now, according to Rav, Rav according to Rav, that a wig it's considered part and parcel of the person unless he pledges it away. In which case he sort of reclassifies it, separate from himself. So in this case, would that didn't happen, certainly it should consider it like part of them. And be spared from destruction. Says the Gemara, there are two formats in wigs. A woman can wear it in a manner which it's really which it's really attached to herself like sort of glue to her head, and then you have his question pertained to a case where it was the tulle was hanging the six of some sort of peg, meaning some sort of peg in the, uh, you know, in the, in the air, and the, uh, the wig is sort of somewhat attached there. It's not really, really connected. It's not really glued to the head. It's not really permanently, you know, joined. So, in that case, there's room to think that, you know, even without pledging it away, it's not going to really considered part and parcel of the body. It's considered like her possessions have to be burnt. Hacha, but in our Mishnah, we would consider it a part of the person unless she pledges it away. We're talking the Mechubra, it's really connected to her. In this case, it's more, you know, part of the person unless she gave it away, which meant, which, 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 in which case she indicates that it's separate from her. In this case, you need to have that added element. Time with the Amr Tznu. Why do we consider it okay and not part of the person? It's because she gave it away, which sort of detaches it from herself. Holy Amr Tznu, without pledging it away, Kuvhu, in fact, consider like her body, omits her and becomes Asr Bahano upon her death. Okay, so back to the Mishnah. Sayer of the Isha is Mutter. Sayer of the Behemoth is Asr. How could the uh, hair of Aisha be mutter? Once she's put to death, she's a mace. Asr Bahano with the hair. Says Rav, we're talking about Peyanach, uh, it's a wig. So A, it's, it's a wig. B, she gave it away. So now it's considered detached and separate. And unaffected by her death. 
Kasha Lila Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak. He had a question on this. Vodumi the Behemoth Katani, the Mishnah pairs it together with the hair from the animal. Mishnah says, the hair of the Isha is Mutter. The animal, its entirety, it's Osir. Ma'asam Gufei. So just like by the, the animal speaking about everything that's part of the animal itself. Right? The animal doesn't have wigs. So if it's his hair, it's his hair. Let's assume that by the woman as well, talking about her own hair. Not a wig. Let me explain to you the Mishnah differently. Why this distinction? Why is it that the hair growing on the Isha, who's being put to death, can still be mutter? Versus the behem, which is us. He says a conceptual difference. True, they're both being put to death. But zoom is sasa isarta. Vuzug mardino isarta. In contrast to the behemoth who's being killed by the best. What makes the behemoth asr? The gmardin, the verdict itself. So even before the animals put to death, Rashi brings the gmar psacham. Starting from the moment of the verdict, the gmardin makes the whole behemoth asr bahano. So whatever constitutes the behemoth, Hema, it's skin, it's hair, it's all Asr. As opposed to the Isha. It's not the Gemardin, it's the actual death. Death experience. And death experience, Rashi says, does not pertain to the hair. Interesting, Rashi. Rashi says, Seir lav bar misahu. There's no concept of death by hair. Shein also lishtane. It doesn't change its format. It doesn't, there's no visible change over on the hair at the moment of death. Right? So, it's not really considered having experienced death. In which case, there's no Isra no on the hair. Very interesting. So, Gondar of Nacham by Yitzchak, even actual hair of the woman is mutter. Even if she died, even put the death by Bezin, it doesn't affect the status of the hair. As opposed to Rav, who said, no, of course it becomes us. It's only because it's a payanach or it's a wig, which was pledged away, right? So two uh, approaches to understanding the Allah of the Mishnah, the Sarahs of the Isha's Mut. Tony Levi could say the Rab. In fact, Levi had a brisa in support of Rab that was speaking about a wig which had been gifted away, which separates it from the woman itself. Herself, Tony Levi could say the Rahmaritzak. And likewise, Levi brought another brisa in support of the other approach. That even actual here is Mut. Tony Levi could say the Rab. First the right to Rab. For Isha she yetzel the woman that's being condemned, right? Taken out to kill. For Amrut Nusar Lebiti, she pledges away her hair. Nice, we give it away. Mesa, but if she died without pledging it, hey, nice, we can't give it away. We pnei Shem Mesa Aser Bahano. It's all Aser. Says the Gemara, Pshita, of course, a lifeless person is Aser Bahano. Obviously, Ella should know you have Mesa Aser Bahano. The point of the rice is to highlight that even adornments, like a wig. Which is present on a person as he's dying is also Bahana. But she gives it away. That sort of detaches it and it's much. Tanakh said Rahmar Yitzchak, we have right to the second approach of Nahmar Yitzchak, that even the actual hair of the Isha's mutter, as we explained, how Isha Shemason and Bisara. So the hair of a woman who dies is mutter, as opposed to Behema Shinergo, Asurubana, as opposed to the animal which is Asur. Uma Hav Shmiz, there was difference between both. As we said, Zumi Sasa is Sarta. What makes the Isha Asr is the act, actual death experience, which doesn't pertain to the hair. The Zug Mardin is Sarta, as opposed to the Behema, who's affected by the actual Gmardin, which covers every uh, facet of the animal. Okay, so let's just recap the Sugya. The Isha, who was uh, condemned by the Bezin, Misa applies to the Isha and to the unborn. Unless, and this is learned from the Pasa, Gam Shneim, considered one single entity, inseparable, as opposed to if the birthing experience had already begun, then we wait for the birth to happen, and then we carry out the uh, Gemar Din. We spoke about the fact that we uh, preempt any, you know, Bezoyin Hameis by ensuring that the uh, unborn is not birthed after uh, the Misa. To explain why the sayer of the Isha is Mutter Bahana. Had no Hakan Marich. Okay, we begin the new parak, says the Mishnah. Ein Ne'erachan. There's a Gersa, Ein Be'erachan. So we'll never find in matters of Erachan an amount less than a Sela. A Sela, by the way, is the Lashon of Mishnah, which corresponds to the shekel found in the Torah, made of four dinarim, etc. There won't be a payment less than a, a Sela. 
in Nerochen Pachas Mesela, and at a maximum, highest payment is 50. Velo Yosr al Chamish, which is the highest rate for the um, male between, uh, you know, 20 and 60. So, minimum is uh, a sella, the cap is 50. Ketzad. Now, here comes another Allah. So, really, if you look in the Pesukim, there's no, doesn't seem to have a, a rate of a sella. The minimum is really three for the Nekeva, the young Nekeva, right? So, how do we get to a sella? The answer is a person can't afford. So, if he pledged 50, but he can't afford it. He's not financially able to support that pledge. So we go, uh, we assess his situation, and we give a discount. Now let's say he got a discount. Kate said, Nosan Sela. We give him a discount, okay, which is at a minimum a sell. You can't go below a sell. It's the smallest payment. Yeah, sure, now he's struck and rich. He won the lottery. He can afford, can afford, sorry, can afford more. Does he have to pay the difference? A nice and clone. He's exempt because once you paid, even if it's a very minimal payment, but that was your obligation. So even if he, his fortunes changed, he's done. But Pachas Misel of Ahesher, suppose he paid less than a seller, which is a non-existence, not a valid payment. Ahesher, now he's struck it rich. His account's still open, his balance, his full balance is still outstanding. Ahesher, no, he's not Chamish he has to pay the full amount. Now let's say, he doesn't have 50, he doesn't have just one, he has five. Is there such a thing as a sort of a sliding scale? Give the five, or may I no. It's either the full amount or the seller payment. Two options, there's nothing in between. You pay one, despite the fact that he has five. It's a sliding scale, nice and that's cool. Give what you could. You have five, give five. And the Mishnah reiterates again. The Gemara will explain what the purpose is. The minimum payment by Erechim is a seller, the maximum is 50. Says the Gemara, ain't Baruch and Pachas Misela. So how do we know the smallest payment is a sella? Min al nechsib v'chol erkecha yeh b'shekel akodesh. There is a payment called shekel akodesh. That's the smallest payment. Kol erkecha shat emarich lo yu b'chusim b'shekel. Any erkecha payment at least has to be a shekel, which is synonymous with the sella in the Mishnah. At the most, it's 50. That's the highest rate, 50. Suppose he has $5 in his possession. The Ramea says, no point. Just give your one. Might have the Ramea. Why? You would think if you can, you know, give what you can afford. After all, your obligation is really 50. The answer is, we find a $50 payment. We find a shekel payment. These are the two options. These are the two prescribed payments. You can't invent a new uh, payment. Oy chamishim, oy shekel, either 50 or 1. For Rabbana, they respond that, uh, yeah, who look kol erech and shata marech. Lo yip chusim yip shekel da osa. What the Yipasig is saying, look, uh, you know, at a minimum, the erech assessment is going to be a shekel. Right? Who da osa. That's what the Pasig is coming to tell us. But if he has more, for that we have another Pasig. Hey, chad is, if he has the ability to pay more than a shekel doesn't let you get away just with a shekel. I'm a crow. The Pasuk says, whatever you could afford, whatever you can access. I'm a crush. Whatever the noider can afford. Look, you can afford more, pay more. For a mayor, he responds to that Pasuk by saying, That Pasuk that you just quoted, is not telling you it's a sliding scale. It's either the full amount or the shekel amount. The Pasuk is just saying that in terms of assessment of financial abilities, it's Yad HaNoider. It's based on what the Noider can do, the pleasure. Not based on the financial status of the subject of your Noider. That's what the Pasuk is coming to teach us. Tezis says Akasha, Tezis says obviously why would I base it on the Noider? She says there's another Pasuk Similarly, is telling us that, you know, that we do uh, go based on the nidar, just like when it comes to, you know, age and gender, it's all based on the nidar. So there's room to think that in terms of financial standing, it's all based on the nidar. It's not so. For Abonon, they respond, you're right, we have to know that as well, but both items can be sourced in the same pasik. Asher, tasig, yada, whatever you can afford, based on your ability. So we learn two things. 
It's based on your abilities and whatever you can afford. Well, automatically, you also learn this idea from the Pasuk as well. The person can has the ability to pay more. Take that payment from him. He's obligated to do so. Interesting, Machleika. So, a fellow pledged a $50 Erech. If he only has one, he pays one. Or if he has five, or Mary says, it's at the 50 or one. There's no payment of five. Rabbanon say, you pay what you can pay. Here comes an interesting case. Amar Vada Barava. Hoi Biyad of Chamish Slam. Okay, so he had five dollars in the bank. Vama Erki Alai. He pledged his own value, which is more than five. Because of Amar, he comes around again and pledged again the same Erki Alai. And his, his ability to pay is five. But he committed twice five now. One Erech for five, followed by another one. So out of the five, look what he did. Vinasan Arbalashnir really should be paying off the first commitment and then the second commitment. He decided to pay out the second account first. But only four. Vinasan Arbalashnir. Vechad Rushen and the last remaining dollar he paid towards the first account. Yatsa Yudeshteh. He exempted himself from both obligations. He paid off both accounts with five dollars. My time. Listen to the reason. Although ideally, right, when you owe Reuven on account of a, you know of a loan they took from him, and then you owe Shimon on account of a loan that you took from him, who do you pay first? First you pay off the first to satisfy your first debtor. But let's say Shimon jumps ahead and takes the money. I mean, you shouldn't be doing it, but if he does it, the fact is it belongs to him. Here as well. He should have been paying out the first obligation, and then this, but the fact is he paid out the second first. Now, although only, only he paid four out of five, the truth is that the second obligation is not really payable at this point. He shouldn't be paying anything. So it's sort of like, be happy that I paid you four, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, svara. So my time is, so why, why is he potter from both? Because really, a balchayv mu'ucha, we compare this to two balichayven, who lent you money. So Shimon, who came after Reuven, Shekadim Vagavu, who jumped ahead and collected before Reuven got a chance to, Masha Gavu, whatever he collected, Gavu is his. So likewise over here, he chose to pay out the second obligation first. Perhaps he shouldn't have, but done is done, paid is paid. Be'idnu diyav l'shnei, that although really, he should be paying five, that's what he could afford, but think of it this way, when he paid out the second one, diyav l'shnei, he paid out on account of the second one, Mishabed l'shnei, really all his money, the full five is bound to the, Bound to the first one. Committed to the first one, Shabbat Rishayna. So Rashi says in the bottom line, so, so really, I shouldn't be paying you at all. So sort of be happy <laughs> that I paid you this much. So that satisfied that obligation. And now that he's left with just one, that's all he has to pay the first. Okay, that's all I could afford. I should toss it again either. I'm off the hook. I pay you the one, I'm done. By the time he gets around to paying the first one, so Leslie has no more than one. Okay, so he emptied his full, full, full account. So now he's potted from both. But let's say we turn to the next time. Let's say he would have gone the other way around. As is proper. First paid towards the first, and then towards the second. Not snobble or showing, he paid only four to the first. Four out of five, it's not a full payment. So his balance, his, thoughts, his account is still open there. Vachas Lashnian chose to take the fifth one and apply towards the second one. Truth is, he's now exempted from the second obligation because he paid out all he had for the second one. But he hasn't yet exempted himself from the first one. Because Kulum Shabdan Rishon, truthfully, all five was really committed to the first one. He should have paid it all. He chose not to. His account still open. So again, he committed himself twice. Twice. Erech, Erech. He had five dollars to pay. He pays four to the second and the remaining one to the first, he's parted from both. Four to the first, which is not a complete payment. And then the last one to the second one, he's yet to the second one, but not the first one. But Ravada Barava, let's say he did it simultaneously. He had access to five cell of Amar and he says, Shnei Erki Alai, He committed himself to a double erech, twice erech, but he said it at one time. Ma, what happens here? Can you just split the five? Two and a half to you, two and a half to you. Since he 
pledged both at once. Ki hadadi tafsan. So both pledges sort of land at the same time, take effect simultaneously, and each one gets two and a half. Tartu pagalah. Yoyev tartu pagalahai. So he pays two and a half on account of this one. But tartu pagalahai, two and a half on account of the other one. And he's done. I don't know you can say. Kulu chazi lahai. All five are really bound to this one separately, as per the other one separately. Each one deserves five. Because you look at each one independent of the other one. And there's five to pick, right? Kulu chazi lahai. All five are bound for this one. All five are bound to this one. Take it, we leave it unresolved. Interesting, Shaila. And the Mishnah reiterates, which is really a repetition. What's the point of repeating this halach again in the Mishnah? The point of the Mishnah is to highlight that we pass like the Rabbana. That it's on a sliding scale. There's no payment less than a seller, but a bit more than a seller. If you can afford, you should. There's a payment which is greater than a seller. Four or five, whatever you can afford. On the other hand, the cap, the maximum payment is 50, but a bit below that, if you can afford, you should. There's a payment less than 50, 48, 47. The mission is highlighting the Rabbana Shita. The Shita of says typically we pass them like the Rabbin, but here perhaps there would be room to think that Ramayr's Svara is strong. We adopt Ramayr's Svara, that you know, there are two absolute options without any. Uh, you know, uh, modifications, comes to the mission and says, no, we pass like the Rabbanon, it's not all or nothing, pay what you could. Okay, all the best to you, and that's Lachara.